So my name is Gordon Young, and this is the Institute of Applied Psychology. We're running monthly webinars on modern clinical hypnosis. And this month, our title is Hypnosis, the Quiet Revolution. It's important that you know who I am. It's important because whoever is your trainer or your facilitator, the skill set, the background, the knowledge of that person makes a big difference as far as how your training evolves. So I've been in the field for full time since 2003. I've been the president of the associations. Um, I'm the former chair of the Australian Board of Neuro Linguistic Programming. I'm a clinical supervisor for a number of organizations. I'm also the former editor of the Australian Journal of Clinical Hypnosis and Hypnotherapy. I'm a published author in the area. I'm the director of a, a, a group called City Hypotherapists, which is where my own graduates uh, come together as a clinic and I feed them clientele. And the big distinction I think that is important for you if you're exploring hypnosis training is my training background. I was trained with the Milton Erickson Foundation in Phoenix, Arizona. It is considered the pinnacle of modern hypnosis training in the world. You need a master's degree to get into it. Uh, there's no other trainer in Australia that has that background. And since then, I've also been invited faculty member to, uh, to run international conferences. So a lot, in many cases, my, my original teachers have become my peers and, and uh, faculty members on that same space. The other thing is that is unique about us is that the 100 Leaders Program, which was the largest study of leadership in Australia, uh, they went after different professions and industries and they assessed who they could work out was the what they deemed to be the leader in that space. And in this space, uh, peer review, reputation field, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they chose us. So let me introduce Cromwell. Cromwell will handle uh, the uh, questions and the chat. So Cromwell, are you, are you there? You're online? Yes, I'm here. So um, what I'm going to be doing is for the Q&A in the chat, uh, for your, all your questions, what I'll do is I'll relate it to, to Gordon a bit later after the presentations. So sit tight and uh, enjoy the webinar. Okay, thanks Cromwell. So there are things that you need to know. I'm assuming you've got an interest in looking at hypnosis as a career or as an add-on to your existing practice. They're the two kind of groups that, that come through our training. People who are starting from scratch or maybe you're already a psychologist or a counsellor or a psychiatrist. So it's important to understand what hypnosis can offer. So here's our overview of tonight. I'm going to look at why you want to look at hypnosis what the evidence is and the applications are. It's often misunderstood in Australia that, you know, there's a lot of suggestion that hypnosis doesn't have evidence behind it. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I'm going to explain some basic differences, some key elements that you need to understand before engaging in kind of hypnosis training. One thing I need to uh, offer from the beginning is my own biases. So let me be very, very clear. My view is that therapy is about achieving results and quickly. You know, some people talk to me about it's important to be in a relationship with your therapist and it should take, you know, it's, it's like um, a place where you, I'm not here for support. I don't want to see a client for a year or two years or five years. I don't even think that's particularly healthy. I think therapist is someone you should know to get an outcome and then you should move on with your life. So there are some models that are more about support. And so, you know, if people don't have people, uh, others they can talk to, confide in, then a therapist can, can play that role. I'm not of that type. I'm not keen to do that. And I'm not teaching a model that is strong on that. The other models are stronger for support. But when it comes to getting an outcome and quickly, I don't think there's another model that 
beats this model consistently and effectively. I know that if I follow the right process, if I've picked up the problem, if I've, if I've assessed it correctly, I will get an outcome. If the client does everything I ask them to do and comes to the sessions I require of them, they will get an outcome. There's no discussion about that. That's going to happen. The only thing that will get in the way is that they don't follow through. They don't continue with us. They don't stay the course. And when I say stay the course, I'm not talking about 30 sessions. I'm talking about three, four, five, six sessions maximum for a presenting issue. So I believe that modern hypnotherapy provides the most consistent results of any model I've ever experienced. And here's my evidence. It's not just um, the evidence of research. In my groups, in the classes where we teach, we've had some very, very qualified people across a whole range of other models. In the last group, we had two psychiatrists. Uh, we often have a, a, probably about a third of the group will already be psychologists and counselors. No one has yet shown me that their model can outperform what we can deliver. In addition, I believe it's a crucial tool that virtually every therapist should have. That even if my main focus is support, which some models are, when people really need to get an outcome, there should be the tool available to make that happen. And modern hypnosis for me is the most consistent version of that. And the other thing is I think modern hypnosis is on the cusp of something great in Australia. You know, we are well behind the states when it comes to uptake on, on hypnosis. Um, in other, you know, the, Australian, the American Psychological Association actually has a whole division uh, dedicated to hypnosis research. In Australia, the Australian uh, equivalent, the Australian uh, Psychological Society doesn't have that. So we're a little bit behind, but we will catch up. And hypnosis is really getting a lot of traction in other parts of the world, particularly in the United States. And whatever happens there typically happens here. So why is it such a powerful therapeutic tool? Here's why. I'm going to say it's a quiet revolution in psychotherapy. It's building. It's growing. And here's the evidence. If you look at the International Journal of Clinical Experimental Hypnosis, 2007, the April edition, Extensive research suggested that no matter what your approach to therapy, hypnosis will tend to amplify your results. So the, let me get some clarity here. Hypnosis isn't a therapy by itself. Hypnosis is the vehicle by which you deliver therapy. So if you are you know, if you're into CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, or ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, no matter what your model you can deliver it hypnotically and you'll get better outcomes. Why? Because so many of the problems we have as human beings are not conscious. It's not our conscious, logical understanding of the world that gets us caught up. It's our emotional, non-conscious space. Whenever we're running a, a pattern of behavior that doesn't work for us, we're not particularly conscious about it. If we're carrying 60 kilos in weight, I can pretty well guarantee you that you're not consciously eating. You don't even give it a second thought. You're going into autopilot in order to do it. You don't consciously choose to be anxious. So, mo so many of the problems that we have do not respond well to just simple talk therapy, that you need to get to the unconscious basis of the problem. Things like self-esteem issues. You can tell people that they're wonderful. They're not gonna take that on board. But at the hypnotic level, you can make suggestions, you can build a case that there's nothing wrong with them. They're okay as they are. They're a work in progress, and they're much more likely to take that up. You know, anecdotally, I kind of suggest that, the, you know, if I can say something in a normal discussion like we're having here now, if I say it in hypnosis, it's 10 times more powerful. I have, I have 10 times the access I would have than in a normal waking state, so as they claim. So for me, I've got a very strong interest and bias towards hypnosis as a clinician. I wouldn't want to be without it. 
So obviously I don't know where you guys are at with it, but a lot of people suggest that there's no evidence behind hypnosis. Nothing could be further from the truth. Harvard is where a lot of the latest uh, resource and research is coming from, but places like Yale, Stanford University, UCLA universities, they all have hypnosis research labs. Any pain management uh, departments attached to universities in the States typically have a hypnotherapist on staff, in some cases more than one. And I'm going to say that mindfulness, the growth of mindfulness, is a movement in this right direction because mindfulness is a non-conscious intervention. It is attempting to get a deliver a message through a more trance-like state, and that's a stepping stone towards this hypnosis uh, modern form of hypnosis that I think uh, can really do a lot more than mindfulness can do. But the research is there for mindfulness as well, and you can tack it on additionally. So what is, in essence, is this? There's a really oversimplified concept of how it might work, but your logical brain, your critical analysis, is like the top of the iceberg that you can see. But your unconscious mind, which really runs everything 24-7, your emotions, your belief structure, your values, your memories, your habits, your operating system, or you don't have to think about digesting food, you just do it. This is where all learning and change occurs. So most of the time, we're not really conscious of what we're doing. We're in autopilot. And that includes our emotional responses to things, our perceptual position on things. If you are a pessimist or an optimist, you don't consciously choose that. That's something that has been ingrained in you that's habituated. And ultimately, that will largely determine the way you perceive the world. Your logical brain doesn't have that much to do with that perception a lot of the time. It kind of kicks in when you have to decide to pull yourself up and reframe it and choose another way of seeing things. But in many ways, what we do with an unconscious process is we actually go to where the problem is, which is in this non-conscious space. So what makes it so effective? Well, first of all, it's brief. So brief therapy by definition is more modern therapy. More, it's, it's anything that would be up to, say, 20 sessions would be considered brief therapy. But hypnosis is generally among the briefest of these forms of modern therapy. Anywhere between the average hypnotherapist, four to six sessions would be the most you would see them for a presenting issue. And that could be a significant issue. I'm not talking about little stuff. I'm talking about serious trauma. I'm talking about um, terrible self-loathing and self-esteem issues. I'm talking about you know chronic anxiety. Depression, you might want a little bit more than four to six sometimes because people, when they're depressed, really struggle to stay with you on anything. But in essence, the, the most I've ever seen anyone was 11 sessions. And that was someone who had to be almost carried into my office because they couldn't function. So the possibilities are significant and people don't have to wait very long to see an outcome. I would expect to see some outcome by the end of the first session. Hypnosis also helps you create new links and new frames of reference. So just putting out to people that what they're doing doesn't make sense really doesn't really help a lot of the time. You can't say to a smoker what you're doing is going to kill you or that it's not good for your health. They go to a machine that says, across the top of it, says smoking kills. So their logical brain's not involved in that what they're going to the machine for is some sort of relief or some sort of buzz, some sort of emotional response. You know, the idea that they might end up with cancer because they'll be one of the one in two people who are smokers who die of a smoking-related illness, that's not real to them in that moment. That's not a, a fact they're holding front of mind. So we, there's no point talking about that with people. They're not really focused on that. Ultimately, we have to deal with this change. And the better we can make it, um, we can make it a lot more effective if we can make it automatic, where people literally just find themselves not taking the action they normally take. 
hypnosis can do that. And the other thing is that hypnosis is an experiential form of learning. So in related to that automatic change, EEG readings, the, the test or show uh, electrical activity in the brain, have shown something very interesting about the hypnotic state. There's a certain reading for memory. There's a certain reading for imagination. There's a certain reading when people see things as they as see things in live in a live setting. Hypnosis actually shows up pretty well the same sort of readings as when someone's experiencing something live. So you could, for instance, take people through. Um, them imagining themselves uh, going for an interview and running through some basic steps they're going to take to ensure they perform well at the interview. What an EDG machine has shown is that they now actually experience that as if they've done it, that that was a real experience. So hypnosis gives them a sense that they not only can do it, but they can do it because they've already done it. So they can come out of your hypnosis session with almost a clear distinction, uh, a new set of skills, a new confidence, because they can imagine something as if they've actually been there. So where is it effective? Well, anything to do with anxiety, obviously. Phobias, panic attacks, uh, anything to do with anxiety generally, sleep disturbance. You know, like a lot, 80 plus percent of the population are going to come to a hypnotherapist for anxiety related problems. Sleep disturbance is one of them. Self esteem issues. I think hypnosis is arguably the most effective method of dealing with people when they're running a self esteem issue. I mean, that thing, that kind of problem can be quite intractable for a lot of people. It's deeply rooted, it goes way back. And ultimately, if you can break that down for something, you change people's lives. Depression. You know, hypnosis and as a treatment for depression, the evidence is significant. In fact, the person who wrote the definition of depression for Encyclopedia is, in fact, a hypnotherapist, uh, Dr. Michael Yabko, who is my trainer. He also wrote the definition of, of, of hypnosis as well for Encyclopedia Britannica. So habit change, addictions, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, all of these, these problems respond very well to hypnotic intervention. The place where, pain, uh, where hypnosis has, has, has had the most significant uh, research has been in pain management. Now that's because it's really obvious and, it's, it, and you can, it can be quite dramatic, but pain management is an area of, of expertise that you could go into if you became a hypnotherapist. Post-operative healing, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, all these problems respond very well to hypnotic interventions. But here's the other thing, and it's really important to know this. This is saying that if you're really considering to come down a hypnosis training line, You've got to understand that not all hypnosis is the same. First of all, there's traditional authoritarian hypnosis. This was my first training. It is still the most common form of training in, in Australia, not so much in other parts of the world, but certainly in Australia. The other main form is modern Ericksonian hypnosis. And since Erickson's model, there have been variants like Neo-Ericksonian. We are in the Neo-Ericksonian camp. So what's the difference between traditional hypnosis as an option and modern hypnosis? Well, Freud played with traditional hypnosis. It talks about unconscious, the unconscious mind being like a vault where the dark secrets lie. So you, know, you go back into the past and look for what went wrong, whether someone said something to you or there was some sort of trauma. Freud was very much about past orientation, really focusing back on all your problems stem from your childhood. It's at least 100 years old in its making. Not much has changed in 100 years old. Yeah, always looking for the root cause. So the base of the problem, 
is in what's referred to as a linear causal model or approach. That is that you're like this because your father said this to you on this day when you were eight. Now, I'm not of this view because your father said lots of things to you. Why was this one so important? Have you learnt to be the way you are through your past? Yes. But you going back and uncovering your past doesn't necessarily make it change. And the other thing about this is that you would pigeonhole the client into your theory. Right? So you don't necessarily spend a lot of time with the client. You listen to the problem they've got and then you've already got a theory about it. And it's very much a directive approach. You know, the expert delivers therapy to you. And a lot of time, there's not a lot of need for a, a, an interview, really, apart to find out what you want, because the distinct elements and individual elements of you aren't really important. The theory is. So this is in hypnosis, this is translated into a scripted or prescribed approach, a one size fits all. And we address the symptoms in a traditional approach. So if you're suffering from anxiety, we put you in a calm blue ocean or we put you next to a mountain stream. A lot of the guided visualization stuff, a lot of relaxation stuff, this is traditional hypnosis. For me, a lot of this is, it's fine. It's kind of feel-good therapy, but it's lacking. As I said before, you don't really need to interview people if you're going to put them in a calm blue ocean. You're really just tackling the symptoms, not the cause, not what's underpinning it. And I'm going to say it has an inbuilt failure rate because the moment you go to a scripted approach, then the script is not going to resonate for everyone. You know, the way most traditional hypnotherapists would operate, if you come in and you're smoking and you want to stop, They've downloaded scripts off the net and they will turn around and read a script to you that just happens to be the script that they like at the moment. And when they get sick of reading that one, they download another one and they start reading other different ones. So the script you get really depends on what the client, you know, the therapist is really up to um, and what they're sick of and what they, you know, what place they're at. There's a number of problems with that. It means that you're interchangeable. And there's a growing resistance to this. I've had a lot of people in the past few years who have come to me where they've had hypnosis before. And they've said, I walked out because the person was clearly reading something and I'm not paying $200 an hour for someone to read something to me. You know, one person said that he opened his eyes. He could see that the woman was reading it off their laptop. And he just got up and walked out. And here's the other thing about this. Those traditional hypnotherapists are basically going to be replaced by a download. Virtually everyone who comes to see you as a hypnotherapist has tried, you know, a, a $15 download off the net. It didn't work. It didn't work because it wasn't tailored to you. It wasn't tailored to your particular circumstance. The truth is if you're a smoker, you smoke for a range of different reasons. Different cigarettes in the day, you smoke for different reasons. Some might be anxiety-based. Some are more habitual. Some are more about comfort. Some are about boredom. They all vary. No two people smoke for exactly the same reason. So if you've got a script, you're already missing a good chunk of people. Now, here's the, let me give you the caveat. When the script and the person come together, it'll, sound, it'll look like magic you'll get an outcome. But that's when those two components come together. It won't work when the person doesn't resonate with the script. So how do we improve the, the outcomes, the results? Well, you go to a more modern approach. The other thing about this with uh, traditional hypnosis, is you move towards regression therapy. Uh, that's where you go, go and look for a forgotten memory of a traumatic experience because that would be the reason why you have the problem now. That's why you're fragile now. There was, must have been some forgotten memory or repressed memory was the usual claim. 
in your past that would explain all of this? Well, here's the problem with that. It is now something that the associations will warn against. Just because a memory comes up in hypnosis does not mean that it's accurate. The research is very clear about this. 20 years ago, they used to think if you came up with a memory in hypnosis, it was definitely would have been true. Now the evidence is quite clear it's not. So going back looking for this could be really um, dangerous because if people now suddenly now, due to your intervention, uh, now think they were sexually abused, they can split their family apart. So the AHA warns against, the Australian Hypnotherapy Association warns against, I would never do it as a clinician. I can resolve virtually every problem that walks in my door without having to go back and look for some hidden or forgotten memory. So traditional hypnosis would still want to do that. And the irony is you will not be supported by the association if someone complained about you taking that action. Past life regression is the same. So I know there's a lot of interest in past life regression. I spoke to the Australian uh, Hypnotherapy Association president today, and I wanted clarification on this before I said anything. They do not officially support past life regression. The insurance companies will often uh, disown you if you go down the path of past life regression. And so if you were to take someone down a past life regression route, and they felt traumatized as a result, or they, um, they struggled and, they, and their life fell apart, you know, they, that was their claim, insurance companies wouldn't cover you and the association wouldn't support you. So again, it's something I would never do. There's a distinction between what you're interested in and what you can prove works. There's a lot of distinction between what you can prove and what I can see. Even with pain management, I can see things happen sometimes that I can't generally prove are going to happen. So especially with physical issues, I don't guarantee I can get an outcome because I can't prove it. And I'll tell people from the outset, this is saying that is on the cusp. Does it happen fairly regularly that they get an outcome? Yes, it does. But I can't advertise it. Because unless it's consistent, I can't prove it. And you've got to remember something. Hypnosis only works because you're using their mind, not yours. Right? The big variable of all therapy is the client. If the client really believes and comes with you 100%, you'll get outcomes. It doesn't really matter what therapy you get. You'll get some sort of outcome. But if the client isn't completely with you, you don't have that rapport and they don't really believe, they're not going to get the same kind of outcome. So you're not really in charge of all of it as a hypnotherapist. You're in charge of what you do, what you say, you know, your level of training, your expertise, your experience. That's what you're in charge of. But you're not in charge of the client. You're not in charge of your client when they go back to their home and have to explain what they're doing. You're not in charge of that. Yeah. So let me crank through this. Erickson, which is the modern form, pioneered all client-centered therapy, which means the efficacy is high because you, you operate around where the client's at. You adjust your therapy to the client. Now the interview is much more important because, and you'll need a specific form of psychotherapy for that. The origin of all modern coaching, psychology, positive psychology, NLP, ACT, solution-oriented approaches, they have all come from the Erickson model. And Erickson's not about the past, he's about the future, or well, the present, the future. You know, he once was quoted as saying, people don't come to change their past, they come to change their future. What we want to know as an Ericksonian uh, therapist is, where are you at, where do you want to be? What's the gap? How do we get you there? That's what we want to focus on. We don't want to go back into your childhood too much. We might go there briefly if we have to, but we're going much, much more focused on where you want to go, how do we get you there. And we're going to focus on strengths and whatever resources you seem to have parked. You know, whenever you have a problem, there are resources that you haven't included. 
that you're not acknowledging. And since Erickson, there's been a range of developments in psychotherapy. Erickson died in 1980. Uh, modern forms of psychotherapy can now be delivered with hypnosis and strategic psychotherapy is amongst them. Strategic psychotherapy is the model that we use. And how, you know, what does that basically claim? Well, here's, give me, I'll give you a, the really quickest of, of our understandings of strategic. All problems begin with a generalization. Okay, that, that might sound odd, but every problem you have, a problem perception starts with a generalization. The moment you say, I'm an anxious person, that's a generalization. The moment you say, I'm not good enough, that's a generalization. You know, the question is not good enough for what? Not good enough according to whom? Not, how specifically are you not good enough? The moment you make it an all, you cannot solve the problem. So every time you run any kind of problem, any kind of concern you run, you've generalized the problem. When you say you can't trust men because you had a bad relationship, the real lesson is you couldn't trust that man, but the moment you say you can't trust men, now that is a debilitating lesson. That's going to mean that relationships are going to be very hard for you moving forward. So all problems have a predictable pattern of thinking and feeling. You can break them down from a cognitive perspective. So a strategic approach says that your inability to make distinctions due to the way you habitually approach the world is actually why you have the problem. It's referred to a, co as to a cognitive skills gap. So I'll give you an example of anxiety. You're not anxious because of your childhood. You're anxious because whatever you happened in, in your childhood, you didn't learn the, the ability to make a distinction between what is possible and what is probable. All anxiety is based in the fear of the unknown. Whatever is unknown to you, you can project and catastrophize into. You're never actually anxious about what's really happening. You're anxious about what you're imagining. So if you can't make the distinction between what's possible, which is just about everything, a plane could land in this building any moment, that's possible. Is it probable? Well, no. But if you mix those two up, your risk assessment will be skewed if that makes sense. I, as a modern hypotherapist, am not going to put you in a calm blue ocean. I need to help you make the adjustment so you can now make a more realistic risk assessment. So moving forward, you might come in because you, there's a redundancy uh, pending, but if I can help you change the distinction between what is possible and what is probable, so you can look and go, well, that's about a 5% chance of happening, then you can decide whether it's even worth listening to or paying attention to, or it's a 95% chance of ha that happening. I need to set up a contingency for that. When you can step away and realistically assess the risk, you no longer run anxiety. You're no longer an anxious person. I used to run anxiety to the point where I had panic attacks before I came to this field. It's the thing that brought me into this field in lots of ways. I came in to resolve my own issues, and then I realized it was a really interesting space and I realized I was pretty damn good at it. So ultimately, if I can make the distinction, I help you make the distinction, then I help you cross contextually across everything in the future. You don't run that same level of anxiety. This is very different from just calming you down. It's very different from just making you mindful. This is changing the way you perceive the world. Another one, especially when things like um, social phobia, what you can trust and what you cannot trust, or who you can trust and who you can't trust. A lot of time, if you can't trust people, it's a simple equation. The trouble is you don't have the capacity to make the distinction between who you can trust and who you can't. Therefore, you don't trust yourself to make the distinction. Therefore, your only course of action is to trust no one. It makes perfect sense. So now you become risk avoidant. You don't want to put yourself out there just in case you're going to get hurt. I need to show you how to make the distinction between who you can trust and who you can't. 
And all of us make these distinctions at an unconscious level. If you're good at being able to make the distinction, you'll have unconscious criteria for being able to do it. My job as a modern strategic hypnotherapist is to pass on that skill set to my client who doesn't have it. And they didn't have it because they never learned it. Another example is between what is useful analysis and what is over analysis. So you cannot run anxiety without overthinking the crap out of everything. That's the only way you can keep it going. But there is a distinction between what is a useful bit of analysis and what is just endless rumination. If you run anxiety, then that's a distinction you don't have. You don't know how to make that distinction. That's one I'm going to have to install. So this is something that we've added on. No one else in the world has actually put this together the way we have. But, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing here, but to run anxiety, there are seven pillars here. You must do all of these things. You must assume that the, the, the power is outside of you. You must focus on your own internal rumination. You must uh, make all your references internally. You must have trouble with uncertainty because that's what you catastrophize is what's uncertain. You're never worried about what's actually happening. You're worried about what you imagine is going to happen. The moment you go into the future to, a, to catastrophize, you're fabricating. All anxiety is future-based. You're never, ever worried about what's happening. You're worried about what you think will be the consequence of what's happening. So it's all in your mind. Now, are some concerns more realistic than others? Yes. And they require some sort of contingency. But if you can't make the distinction between what is realistic and what isn't, you're going to run anxiety more generally. This is a key distinction that my students and my graduates are using this. It's part of a book that's about to be published. And it's the first time anyone's done it in the world to put it together quite in this, in this way. So maybe let's stop for questions. I believe Cromwell or uh, maybe... Yes, uh, we do have um, questions here. Um, first question is coming from Mark uh, from Brisbane. His question is, is hypnosis safe? Okay, the, the answer to that is it depends. In, in the hands of a well-trained person, it's safe. There are no drugs. Uh, there are no, uh, if you stay away from the whole past life thing or you stay away from the uh, digging up people's past and trying to find a memory they don't have, then yes, it's safe. You do need to be well trained though because it is a powerful tool. You know, you can influence people with what you say and so you've got to say something that's um, congruent for them. You've got to say something that's appropriate and, and the key is to do no harm. So it is important. I do spend time in my clinic having to undo some shoddy work of other hypnotherapists because they, with good intent, just didn't understand the power of their own words. So it is important to understand the certain uses of language. So for instance, if I said to you, don't think of a blue tree, what do you do? You have to think of a blue tree because you can't speak of the negative. You know, there is no word, there's no image for don't. So when you imagine the blue tree, I've directed you to do it, even though I said don't. Well, what if that says, what if I'm saying don't worry about it? Don't stress, don't eat sugary or fatty foods. I've just directed you to do exactly that. So it is important that you understand the power of your own language and it's not complex, it's just stuff you have to know. So there are people out there trying to be hypnotherapists with two days or three days training. They will run a lot of those mistakes, I'm pretty well guarantee it. But a well-trained person, it's pretty safe stuff. Um, not a single fully trained hypnotherapist in this country has ever been sued for malpractice. That is unique. That is very rare across therapy, therapy uh, models. 
Um, yes. We have um, about eight questions here. Okay. So we're going to address um, a question from Alex Attard. Um, what are expected class sizes in the Melbourne courts? Yeah, somewhere between 25 and 30. Would be, that would be our norm, 25 to 30. Here's the thing. You want to make sure, as, as a school, what we want to make sure of is that you have enough people to work with different people constantly throughout the training. You've got to be together for 16 days, but if you're only working with the same three or four people, then you'll get used to the way those people respond to things. What's really important is that you learn during the training that you can say the same thing to two different people. They're not going to respond the same way. So you've got to make the adjustment to the client. So that's important. But what you don't want is 50, 80 people where the trainer can't really be across where you're at or that you it ends up becoming more of a lecture from the front. So 25 to 30 people is about, you know, 30 has got to be our absolute max. Um, but somewhere around the 24, 25 is a really good number. Okay. Great, because it breaks into threes and breaks into twos. We have another question here from Claire Godding. Um, how does it work with people who have real mental illness, such as bipolar, autism, disorder, etc.? Well, the first thing I'd say is that if you're not already trained to deal with those people, you sh they are not our clientele. As a general hypnotherapist, mental illness is not something that is within your scope. If you're already a psychiatrist, then, or you're already qualified psychiatrist, psychologist, then you can deal with it. Hypnosis can work with some of those models, because some of those same people, because the same pillars are true for them as they are for anyone else. It's not just going to work with their schizophrenia, but if they're running high levels of anxiety, you can still work with that. So with the caveat of you must already be qualified to deal with mental illness, it has good efficacy rates uh, in that space as well. Um, we have another question here. Yeah. From, um, from, Kareem, from Kareem Ainley, how long is a session? What I recommend my students do, well, okay, let me tell you about the normal industry. The industry is usually the first session will be an hour and a quarter. People would spend an hour getting a, um, a bit of history about your problem and then they give you 15 minutes of relaxation. The trouble with that is that a lot of people don't come back. They've just spent a lot of money just to give their, their history and they didn't really get much out of it. I'm gonna suggest, I always suggest my students that you do at least an hour and a half to two hours is the first session and you get into dealing, addressing the issue so that they can tell at the end of the first session that something has shifted. If you're any good and by the end of the training, you should be, then the client should be able to assess in most cases, depending a little bit on what is, you know, is the presenting issue, that something has happened. Thereafter, you'd be looking at one hour sessions as a standard. And that would be, you know, as you talk about the hypnosis, my first hypnotic session would be about 50, would be about 25 minutes. And then thereafter, about 20 minutes. I record every session so the client then can listen back to the recording because they're not, you know, they're not a, a, a yogi, they're not a, a practiced uh, uh, monk. They, they still have their thoughts and will go off to different directions. They'll think about what they're going to do later in the day. And so they won't attend to everything you're saying. That's pretty normal, whether it's in hypnosis or any other form. But, um, but then they will pick it up when they listen again to it at home. Um, one more question, um, another question here, and this is the second last question for the night. Um, it's from Dana Wall. Um, could you please tell us a little more, a little bit more about the course itself? Um, well, my aim wasn't to talk too much about the course itself here. Uh, that's saying that I encourage you to talk to the office about, but we run the longest training that I know of in, 
in, uh, as in face-to-face. It is the most modern, advanced form of hypnosis that is available in the world today. If you sign up uh, and you start the course in this second half of the year, Michael Yabko, who wrote the definition of hypnotherapy for this uh, American for the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, I'll have him out here in February next year and you can actually experience him live. Uh, it may well be the last time he comes to Australia. He's getting to that retirement age. He keeps threatening to not come back, but he's coming back for us this year. And um, it's very experiential. It's very practical because it's really important that you know how to do this. Uh, a lot of the lecture work is recorded and it's online as well. I mean, in some cases we do it during the class because you can't just do hypnosis all day. You'll literally wander out of there or float out of there like a zombie. So okay. we mix up practical and theory. And the theory, again, is very practical. It's not really about what you're going to learn in a textbook. The entire course is directed to clinical practice. What are you going to do when a client's in front of you? That's the only focus of this course. We're not doing statistics or anything else like that, that quite frankly, I'm not sure how that helps you when you're in front of a client, but we're not doing any of that stuff. It's all about what you do when a client's in front of you. Because here was my biggest fear when I first started this. What if a client comes in and they, they talk about their problem and the last thing I wanted was to sit there and think, oh my God, I have no idea what to do here. I don't want that for you either. That would suck. So what we're going to teach you is going to allow you to never have that concern. You'll always have something you can do. Uh, and, you know, you'll have supervision thereafter. So you can always ring us and say, okay, I've had this client. I've had the first session. I'm a little bit concerned about what I do next. What do you think? So you get supported moving forward as well. That's a pretty important piece. I don't know, I don't know if that answers your question, but I know we're short of time. So yeah. um, Last question. We have 14 other questions lined up. So we probably get, can address that. Um, via phone call tomorrow with Grace. But yeah. for the last question of the night, uh, we're just running out of time, that's all. It's from Corrine Ainley. Um, the question is, do you teach how to work with children? Well, working with, we don't specifically go after that, but working with children is exactly the same, but you just have to change your, your language to be age appropriate. The, the cognitive patterning that I talked about, you know, the overthinking, the catastrophizing, all that stuff is true in a five-year-old. We learn it very early. The patterns of thinking that we have as adults, we actually, uh, we learn by the time we're five, six, seven, eight. In fact, Martin Seligman is doing a study and doing some work at Geelong Grammar. Martin Seligman, the, the father of modern positive psychology, is doing work at Geelong Grammar in Victoria with, young, with people around the age of seven because his theory is if we can get them early, they won't learn those patterns. They won't learn those negative, pessimistic patterns. We want to teach them to be optimists. So in essence, all therapy, in my view, is about teaching people to be more optimistic, to be more, to be more realistic about what's really happening in the world and how, and how effectively they can potentially manage it. If you can do that, their problems start to fade away. If you're a real pessimist, you will run anxiety much more often than an optimist. So uh, kids, it's just being age appropriate. You would talk, tell them stories that have meanings to it. You know, I recently told a five-year-old a story about Kevin the unicorn, and um, I just had to make it up as I went. And yes, essence, the child got the message. They stopped bedwetting. So you just have to make it appropriate to the age. But in essence, the same skill set is required whether they're five or 55. Come on. Okay. Um, I think that's it. We're just running out of time. Um, well, let me just finish this off then. Yep. And I'll just go to these next slides. So how do I know this is the best choice as far as the therapeutic uh, if you're going to go down the hypnosis line, how do I know that this choice that I'm offering is the best one? 
This is a photo I took at the uh, Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference in December 2018. This is the largest psychotherapy conference in the world. It's run by the Milton H. Erickson Foundation, where I went to school as a hypnotherapist. It is run by Hypnotherapy School. That image of that person on screen is Aaron Beck, the father of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the big boy on, on, you know, on the world stage. Um, you might see a little, little piece of, uh, of turquoise there. That's his daughter, Judith Beck, on stage. The best of the best all come to this Hypnosis School's uh, conferences. It's hardly known over here in Australia, but the school I went to is the pinnacle of psychotherapy almost generally across the world, and it's a hypnosis school. Then, of course, there's the research that tells me, and a lot of it's now coming out of Harvard. My own experience, if I was operating anything less than a 90% success rate, I wouldn't be in the field. You know, there are people who talk to me from different models of how they're really pleased with a 40% success rate. I think that's rubbish. I think a 40% success rate, I wouldn't want to be part of it. For me, if the client does everything I ask, turns up to their sessions, then I will expect an outcome. If I'm not getting an outcome, either I've missed the problem or the client hasn't told me something or they haven't done their homework. There are the only three reasons why I'm not going to get an outcome here. And most of the times they haven't done their homework. So I know that straight away. You come back for a second session and you say nothing much has changed. I know you haven't done what I've asked you to do. That's pretty well it. So that, what I like about this model is it gives me that certainty. I'm not throwing darts at a wall. I know for sure if I follow the process and I target the different elements that I'm going after in hypnosis, I will get an outcome, guaranteed. The testimony of other professionals in the class to give an example, this is the most recent one. There was a psychiatrist in my last group and she stayed back on one of the last days of the course and she said, Gordon, I just want to tell you something. What you're teaching us is almost the direct opposite to what I was taught. But it makes so much more sense. And I can now see why so many of my clients don't really get results. But I'm now using, I'm incorporating some of your strategic models. She, she was not allowed to use hypnosis where she was working. But she was including the strategic psychotherapy. And she said, it's working. I'm getting some outcomes now. So even if you don't learn, you don't use hypnosis, strategic psychotherapy is like the next big thing. I've got hundreds of graduates using these pillars and they've been using them for the last nine years. And I'm always asking for feedback. Are the pillars accurate? Is this what you're seeing? The answer is always yes. And the most recent bit of evidence I've got is I have a Newcastle professor who's now going to edit the book I'm writing, which is a clinician's guide to strategic psychotherapy. He's looked at it and he's, his statement was, Gordon, I think you're on something. I don't think you even realise what it is. This is the next advancement in psychotherapy. That's how big he thinks this can be. Now, that'll come down to how much I promote it and how, you know, how I get it out there. But the, he thinks it's got that kind of legs. So it's not just my view. It's also of others around me. So could you really do it? The answer is, for most of you, obviously I don't know who you are, but the answer is yes. If you have some life experience, you uh, know how to go after problems and tackle them, you care about getting outcomes. If you're all about support, maybe this isn't for you. But if you want to get an outcome, you want to make a difference in the world and you want the tools to do it, then yes. So what's next? Well, if you want a career in hypnotherapy, just speak to us. It's, it's pretty simple. Uh, talk to the office. They'll give you a call tomorrow anyway just to, you know, courtesy call. Find out whether we got, gave you what anything that you needed, what else you know, we're only talking about a short period here, so what else you, do you need to know? But here's the other thing I wanted to say. The other thing that is important is that we have a new initiative. What we found is that by the end of the course, you're no longer worried you can do the work. 
you're okay with that. You know you can do it. But what we found was students had a new concern, and that was how will they set up their own practice? How will they, where do I get a website from? You know, how do they promote themselves? How do they run their own business? That became the big concern. And this was not something I had anticipated. So we've made an adjustment. Cromwell, who's a digital marketing guru, is now going to set up, and we've already started, we will produce all your marketing for you if you choose. So we'll put together your website, we'll set up Google Ads, that'll put you on page one of Google on day one of you being out there. We'll set up Facebook ads, we'll do that whole lot for you. No one else has ever done this before. But this is how we ensure that you get the outcomes you you want. This is how we ensure you get out there and that you're effective in the world because we need effective therapists in this space. There's plenty of unprofessional people in in the complementary fields. We want you to be successful. If you're any good, we want you out there. So if it's going to be your marketing that's going to hold you up, we've resolved that. It's done. We've we've got it for you if that's what you want to do. So I think that's all, Crom. What else have you got that I might need to talk about? Anything? I think um, that's it. So this is one of the first few webinars that we are doing about hypnotherapy. We also do NLP, which is conversational um, hypnosis, really. Um, So stay tuned if you are interested. Keep on watching. Thank you for coming. And Gordon, up up to you again. Over to you. All right. So if if that's it, uh, I hope this has been of value to you. Uh, We will use uh, these webinars for different topic areas within the hypnosis and NLP spaces. Uh, But if you want to know more about the course per se, the best thing is to talk to a someone in the office here's the things we offer you can sit in if there's a if there's a course coming up you can sit in come in and sit with anyone talk to anyone you want in the class before class starts that's how open we are and transparent we are you can come and meet me if you want to come and we'll sit and have a coffee together let's find out whether this is right for you or not whether it's a good fit for you or not or if you want to you can talk to past students any way you want it, let's see if we can facilitate that for you because we want you to be certain. We want you to be as certain as you can be before you take the action that you're in the right place. We know once you're there, you're going to believe that to be true, but we know you're not there yet. So call the office, take an action, get proactive about it, and let's see if, if this is your next big career. Okay. Thank you, everyone.